In the second part of my presentation, I'm going to deal with the diagnostic management of iron overload disease and expanding my presentation to deal with some of those secondary forms as well. What are the management objectives? Well, they're really four in number. Early diagnosis, ideally to prevent organ damage, before we reach that stage that I showed you of massive iron overload. To do that, it has to be an early detection mechanism in order, hopefully, to promote longevity. And who would be the best recipients for this detective process? Well, obviously, first-degree relatives of probands who've been diagnosed with hereditary hemochromatosis, therefore in a higher risk general population. Obviously, from the genetic basis that I've provided for you, it is predominantly in the Caucasian population, but I have seen it in African Americans also. So it should not be totally excluded from consideration in minority populations. Then on to optimal treatment of probands who are and detected cases, cases that have been detected by screening methods, optimal treatment by rapid and safe iron removal, and I'll be dealing with that in more detail. And what should be the appropriate follow-up and maintenance treatment for such individuals to prevent target organ damage? Because essentially, the finding of a genetic predisposition is not disease in itself. And what this whole management objective concept is aimed at is preventing the consequences of that genetic predisposition. First of all, I'll deal with the early diagnosis to prevent organ damage. And does this prevent, does this promote longevity? Well, we have some excellent long-term studies, follow-up studies of individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis to suggest indeed that those aims are justified. And here from Richard Sally in Australia is a diagram showing you the relationship on the left, the vertical axis, of tissue iron concentration, in this case from the liver, with the age of the individual. The blue circles on this picture are individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis. The closed blue circles are individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis who had already developed cirrhosis or diabetes. The yellow and the red circles at the bottom are other individuals with liver disease for comparison. And I'll be dealing with some of those later on. You can see from that diagram there that as the age of the patient progresses, the tissue iron concentration has increased. And you could put a straight line, a regression line, through the blue dots and show a very good correlation between the age of the individual and the amount of iron accumulated in the liver. On that vertical axis, the normal upper limit is about 30 on that scale. And you can see that virtually all of these, particularly by the age of 40, have developed considerable accumulation of iron in their liver. And many of those have already gone on to the closed circles, namely fully developed cirrhosis. That relationship between iron concentration and age is exclusive to hereditary hemochromatosis, and certainly iron accumulation of this magnitude we only see in those specific genetic diseases I showed you earlier. How is the accumulation of iron related to disease? Well, here happened to be evidence from Germany, from Niederau and colleagues in Dusseldorf, that showed you that the stage of fibrosis and ultimately cirrhosis under level three here is clearly quantitative related to the amount of mobilizable iron. And when I talk about mobilizable iron, this is iron that's been removed in the course of treatment by phlebotomy. And you can add up the amount of blood donations until the patient is de-ironed that really represent the total body iron stores. And you'll see here that there's quite clearly a relationship. That the more iron is mobilizable, the more likely you are to have gone on to end organ damage. How does this affect longevity? Well, here's the study from the same group in Dusseldorf, 
looked at the survival of individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis and compared them with an age and sex matched normal population over a 30 year time period. And I think you'll need little convincing that there's an increased mortality in the individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis compared with the normal control population. But if you divide the hereditary hemochromatosis patients up into those that have got cirrhosis on the lower part of this, and those who have not developed cirrhosis on the upper part solid line, you'll see that the non-cirrhotic hereditary hemochromatotics actually have a normal survival. Whereas those who've developed cirrhosis, and it happens to be also those who've developed diabetes, have a considerably decreased survival. So I think that the evidence is there that the amount of iron determines the amount of disease, and the amount of iron determines, through the development of disease, determines survival. And what do individuals with hemochromatosis die from? Well, this is again from the Dusseldorf study. And in this particular study, they looked at 251 patients over the 30-year period, of whom 69 died. Of those 69, 60% of them died from causes related to hemochromatosis, as opposed to coincidental other diseases. And if you look at those that can be ascribed to hemochromatosis, if you add up liver cancer and cirrhosis, you'll see that the vast majority are related to the development of complications of liver disease. 5% of deaths related to complications of diabetes mellitus. And in a smaller group, cardiomyopathy, which it also occurs in a younger population where the heart is the target organ <clears throat> predominantly. And you'll see on the right side of the slide the mortality ratio, the observed mortality over that expected. And for liver cancer, 120-fold higher than expected in a control population. For cirrhosis, 10-fold higher. I think there's little conviction that I need to add to this, that these causes of death related to iron overload are the principal culprits here. So how do we go about early detection to promote longevity? What are the, what are the detection methods? And we have a number of simple, initially simple techniques at our fingertips that allow us to make the diagnosis of iron overload. Obviously the clinical observation of the patient, a pigmented patient with a large liver and diabetes, you have to think about bronze diabetes, i.e. <clears throat> the triad that I showed you early on, described by the early clinicians. But now we have other techniques available in the doctor's office. And blood testing, for the most part, is inexpensive and simple and can be done from the doctor's office in most laboratories, namely the transferrin saturation and the serum ferritin level. As I show you in a moment, we can now also do the HFE mutation for a relatively inexpensive test also. And those three things can give us a very close idea of the suspicion for iron overload. I'll come on to liver biopsy and other techniques a little bit later. The development of an algorithm for the diagnostic evaluation of patients with hereditary hemochromatosis. It's been published last year in hepatology by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. And you'll see on the left it's divided up into three levels, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one is inexpensive. You can do this for about $50, the combination of transferrin saturation and serum ferritin. We now know that a saturation less than 45% and a normal ferritin virtually excludes iron overload disease, whereas a transferrin saturation of more than 45% with an elevated serum ferritin in symptomatic, asymptomatic, or relatives is a very suspicious finding. And it's those individuals that we then choose to go on to stage two testing, namely the gene test for the C282Y mutation that can be done on a blood sample. And finding the genotype homozygous for those mutations 
for that mutation adds very clearly to the suspicion of hereditary hemochromatosis. Going on to the next stage, beyond stage two evaluation, is then a big decision point in diagnostic and therapeutic management. And it turns out that the level of serum ferritin, after you've done the HFE mutation, the level of serum ferritin quantitatively gives you a pretty clear idea of those individuals at risk for fibrosis and cirrhosis of the liver. And you'll see on the right here that a ferritin more than 1,000 micrograms per liter, particularly in association with elevated liver enzymes, is an indication for a liver biopsy for two things, to measure the amount of iron in the liver, to stain for it, and to look at how advanced is the liver disease. With a ferritin less than 1,000 and a normal set of liver enzymes, you're really free of risk of having end-stage liver disease, and therefore can then be offered therapeutic phlebotomy as your mode of management to remove iron. On the left-hand side, I do show you the variant situations that you may come across, and it's certainly we find in our clinical practice where you have a heterozygote or a so-called compound heterozygote where that other mutation, the H63D, may be associated, and they have to be pursued in their own evaluation to exclude other liver diseases or hematologic diseases, and that often requires a liver biopsy. The value of the serum ferritin has been shown both in family and population studies. And I show you two studies here, one from Paul Adams in Canada on the left that happened to be largely amongst individuals related to someone with classical hemochromatosis, in which you'll see that both in males and females, more than 80% of individuals have an elevated transferrin saturation, more than 45%, and an elevated serum ferritin. But contrast that with Dr. Beutler's study on the right, which was a study from San Diego, which took a population unselected from the population at large of over 40,000 individuals and looked for the frequency of homozygous C282Y hemochromatosis. He found 152 individuals, but note here that the finding of elevated transferrin saturation and serum ferritin was very different comparing females with males. And it was only in the males that the predominance of these abnormalities were noted. In the female population, they were much less prevalent and therefore less reliable for picking up the potential for later life iron overload. The relationship of serum ferritin to iron stores in the liver, liver iron stores, is shown from Paul Adams's group here again. And for the most part, you'll see this is a widely scattered set of points on this. The overall trend being that the higher your serum ferritin is, the higher your liver iron concentration is. But you'll find many exceptions to this because serum ferritin can be subjected to all sorts of false positive results based upon other conditions other than hereditary hemochromatosis. Coming back to the prediction of cirrhosis from the ferritin, though, is a very important finding. And this, I think, was the proof positive. In our 355 individuals, homozygous for the C282Y mutation, indicating that a serum ferritin less than 1,000, there were no cases of cirrhosis at all. On the other hand, with a serum ferritin more than 1,000, you can see here that you've got about a 50-50 chance of having fibrosis, and in some cases, cirrhosis. So it's the negative predictive value of the lower serum ferritin that's important in excluding the need to proceed to liver biopsy. So if we come back to this algorithm again and talk about the liver biopsy, is this mandatory? Well, it's 
in our view, mandatory in individuals who have that very high serum ferritin, as a prognostic indicator to show you whether there is fibrosis or cirrhosis. You can proceed to therapeutic phlebotomy if you have the safety valve of a ferritin below 1,000 in the face of normal liver enzymes. So we come back to Richard Sally's data here. That is the explanation there for why on the blue circles, individuals mo mostly over the age of 40 have got the higher tissue concentration and many of those have already got cirrhosis or fibrosis. If you relate that concentration to age by a ratio shown on the vertical axis here as the tissue iron index, which is the liver iron concentration divided by the age, you can see here the blue symbols in the middle of hereditary or genetic hemochromatosis all have an index with a ratio for the most part greater than two. There's a slight overlap, but overall greater than two. And whether or not you've got fibrosis with the closed circles on the right or the open circles on the left, you're still in that category for hereditary hemochromatosis. In contrast to those in yellow and those at the right of other forms of liver disease in which the index, namely the ratio, is usually less than two. Now this is not an absolutely proof positive of the selection of hereditary hemochromatosis, but <clears throat> it on the whole provides us with a fairly good indicator for what we're dealing with in terms of the underlying diagnosis. So the liver biopsy has that value in showing us by getting the iron concentration measured on a tissue sample, which is very easy to do. We send it out based on the same biopsy that we evaluate for histopathology. But are there alternatives to liver biopsy? For example, the amount of iron removed by phlebotomy would an in, be an indication in, in some individuals of total iron stores. And we do, in those who are opposed to the idea of liver biopsy, use that sometimes as the ultimate criterion for iron overload. Now you'll see on the bottom here that we also are looking into non-invasive methods, such as MRI, <clears throat> and the development of MRI techniques to measure iron is really developing uh, at quite a rapid rate. And this happens to be a study from France, published in a hematologic journal, that shows you on the bottom here biopsy iron concentration related <clears throat> on the vertical axis to the mean transverse relaxation time, which is a measurement that can be made on a calibrated MRI dedicated for this purpose. And you can see here there's a really quite nice correlation between biopsy iron concentration and that particular measurement. But this does require a dedicated instrument. It requires special calibration. And <clears throat> for the most part, it's not as accurate at the lower levels as it is at the very high levels of tissue iron concentration. But I suspect in the coming years that we're going to see further development of this technique that would allow us to do MRI a substitution for measuring the iron concentration on a liver biopsy, even though it doesn't replace the evaluation of histopathology. So liver biopsy is therefore useful for two reasons, the iron concentration and staging. And this is what most of us would still be recommending because it's this condition here that we're trying to prevent, namely end-stage liver disease with fully developed fibrosis and massive iron overload in regenerative nodules. In the final section, I'm going to be discussing treatment and give you some indication of where we are in current management.